Welcome back to the Celestine Light Esoteric Mystery School. This video is different than all of the others as it is specifically for people actively involved or interested in the spiritual path of Celestine Light. If this is not you, then you should skip this video and enjoy any of the others available on our channel which are for the general public. A few weeks ago, I asked everyone to submit any questions they had about angels. In this video, I will answer those questions. So the first question is, how do you know about angels? Different things are taught by different people in different religions. How do you know that what you believe is correct? The answer is that it's not what I believe, it's what I know. I am answering these questions as an apostle of Celestine Light. I know the answers based upon my personal experiences receiving life-saving help from angels on multiple occasions and communing and communicating with angels on a regular basis plus the detailed teachings about angels that are found in the oracles of Celestine Light. Now the first time that I ever had an experience with my guardian angel when I, that saving my life was when I was just three years old. And guardian angels have saved my life and the life of family members numerous times in very miraculous ways. I mentioned just a couple in the previous guardian angel video number four and also my wife Samara's also mentioned a couple of her experiences and our shared experiences in the Guardian Angels number three video. And I've been in life and death situations so many times that if Guardian Angels weren't saving me, then I am surely the luckiest man that ever lived. Now the fact is that many of my life-saving experiences occurred in miraculous and supernatural ways. And there's really no other way to explain how I survived. I had my first angelic experience encounter at 16 which I wrote about in my book, Angels of Miracles and Manifestation, along with many other accounts of my angelic experiences. I'm now 63. Between 16 and 63, I have spoken with angels in two-way conversations, telepathically, innumerable times. Occasionally, angels speak audibly to me. Their advice and warnings have always helped me and my family and my friends in more ways and more times than you can imagine. I was called by angelic intervention during the winter solstice of 2004 to be the scribe to witness the events recorded in the 800 page book Oracles of Celestine Light. The experiences over five years that brought forth that book were unlike anything I've ever heard or read about before. And the best way I can describe it is that spiritual time travel back to a time 2,000 years earlier. From that experience, I connected in my calling as the witness and scribe with the Angel of the Covenant. In the oracles, she's called Miriam of Magdala. In the Bible, she's known as Mary Magdalene. Miriam, the Angel of the Covenant, has taught and continues to teach me many secrets of the light. And I share that knowledge and advice with people who study the oracles of Celestine Light in countries all around the world so they too can benefit from the wisdom of the Angel of the Covenant. Next question is, how many types of angels and kinds of angels are there? Well, that's a good question. And there are three principal types of angels. Archangels are like department heads or supervisors. For instance, the Archangel Azrael is the Archangel of the Soul. Serving under Azrael, there are stewardship angels. For instance, the Angel of Character is Stradinel. The angel of soul passage is Ra A A A S. The angel of inner life connections is Eustasis. The angel of past lives is Yukolasquan. And the angel of fortune forgiveness is Alvotar. And the angel of meditation is Dalin. All of those serve under the angel, the archangel Azriel, the archangel of the soul. Now, stewardship angels are actually the best angels to contact for help in the specific areas of their stewardship. Though people, and all, people often call upon the archangels because they're the ones that are commonly known in public literature and religious traditions, they seldom actually handle requests directly. Instead, they're going to assign them to one of the most, whoever the most appropriate stewardship angel is to take care of, of that request. By calling directly upon the appropriate stewardship angel, you eliminate a step and your results will almost always be quicker. Now Miriam of Magdala, whom I communicate with several times a year, is the Angel of Covenant, as I mentioned, and that is a stewardship angel. 
My book, Angel of Miracles and Manifestation, gives details on 14 archangels and 130 stewardship angels and how to call upon them and benefit from their blessings. The third type of angels number in the millions. They are helper angels and perform a wide-ranging multitude of duties as called upon and directed by the archangels or the stewardship angels. Next question is, I noticed some other angel teachers on YouTube say that guardian angels don't actually do anything to actively physically protect you. What do you say? Hmm. Well, my numerous personal experiences and those of family members and friends loudly testifies that angels can and do intervene to help us in physical ways when the circumstances warrant their help. Enough said on that one. Question. Did people like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, and Mao Zedong have guardian angels? And how can an angel of God tolerate watching out for mass murderers and other very evil people that hurt many other people? And that's a good question I'm sure many people have asked. Well, all people are matched with guardian angels at birth, but these are angels of God. They're of the light. They watch over and help people living in the light, not people living in the darkness. If a person is truly evil in their heart and actions, they will have no help or even the ability to connect or communicate with an angel of light or an angel of God. Next question, as a follow-up, what about the victims of these evil murderers? How come their guardian angels didn't protect them? Well, to paraphrase what many people have asked, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, the flip side of that question is, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? And that's a challenging question. And without stepping on the toes of people from many different religions and beliefs. So I can just answer it from what I know from the teachings of the angels through Celestine Light. Number one, physical life is a school. And it's the school of hard knocks. That's the way it was designed to be for our personal growth and expansion. The understanding and knowledge that we gain from personal experience even very traumatic and bad ones, helps us to grow and expand as humans and children of light. Those experiences help us to be more sympathetic, more empathetic, and more helpful in the future to other people in distress. Number two, another reality is that life traumas help us to get closer to God. In many cases, people connect to the greater light for the very first time in their life only after they've experienced something very traumatic in their life. And as many soldiers will testify, when the bullets and bombs are flying all around, there are no atheists in the foxhole. And number three, the trials and tribulations of life are also stepping stones to greater faith in the divine. Faith in a greater light beyond this life is actually very important because faith is literally a mighty, mighty power, both spiritual and physical, that can help you accomplish great things in this life. Now, probably the best written example of faith, despite adversity, is the book of Job in the Old Testament. It's an allegorical story showing how Job kept his faith in the light, in God, despite every adversity in the world befalling him except death. And he was blessed in the end because of his steadfast, unwavering faith. Now, four, if you believe that this short life of 60 to 100 years is it, and that there's no eternal life or even reincarnated life, then you certainly don't believe in angels anyway. But if you do believe that there's more to existence than just this short physical life, then as heart-wrenching as some experiences may be, in the eternal perspective of existence, this life is only a blink of an eye. Next question is, as a follow-up to that question, if guardian angels are real, why does anyone die or have accidents? Why aren't there guardian angels protecting them? And that is a great question. <laughs> First, let's remember that guardian angels are only going to help people that are living in the light, not in the darkness. It doesn't matter what someone's religion is, or even if they don't follow any religion at all. It does matter that they're a good person. Not a perfect person, but one who each day tries to live a life of honesty, compassion, helpfulness, and love. One who values and listens to others' opinions, even if they're different and one who is cordial to friends, family, and strangers. Remember too that life is a school. You learn from your experiences both good and bad, and you grow or diminish as an individual based upon how you react to challenges in your life. One of my favorite quotes is, life is a grindstone. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you up, 
depends upon what you're made of. It's also very important to remember that in the scale of eternal life, this physical life, as I said, is only a single blink of your eye. Although it's a very important moment in your eternal life progression, and it seems at the time to be all-encompassing and consuming when you're living it, this life is actually only a small moment in time in your life that will never end. Now, guardian angels most often do not intervene in your life to help in any way unless you specifically ask for their help. If you know them and ask their help, they will always respond, unless there's a very good reason for your eternal benefit and progression that they do not. Responding when you ask their help is actually their sacred duty, as long as it's actually in your best interest in an eternal perspective. Remember, your experiences, both good and bad, are important for you to have, to help you grow stronger, better, and to have more faith. And having accidents, and even dying, is part of your journey in the school of physical existence. It isn't important how many days or years you have in this life, but what you do with those days and years, and how you demonstrate with your daily actions that you are a child of light. When a guardian angel does intervene, when they haven't been called, as they sometimes do, to prevent accidents or loss of life, it is usually because the person that was saved needs to be present at some point in the future to be of particular benefit and blessing to other people. Next question, can your guardian angel be someone who is living? My friend saved a young girl from drowning when he was in his early teens that a few years later his parents ended up adopting, but they didn't know each other at the time. Could he be a guardian angel for her, but living in a human body? I've read other accounts of what appear to be normal people saving the lives of other people in miraculous and impossible ways. Okay, the answer to that question is, though angels can appear in human form, and are the only beings that can exist in both the higher energetic realms and on our lower energy earth, they do not live their lives as humans. The one exception is if they are a human that has been called to translate from mortality to immortality without tasting death, and to take on the office and stewardship of an angel. Miriam of Magdala is a perfect example of this rare exception to angels living in a human life. As detailed in the Oracles of Celestine Light, once she received her calling to become the Angel of the Covenant, she had 11 years to remain on the earth. This was a time when she had the powers granted to the Angel of the Covenant, but was still learning how to fully perform the duties of the office. She had 11 years, basically, to apprentice under the current Angel of the Covenant, who had preceded her in the office and calling. And that's a very important thing that we should point out, is that angels are not a eternal position of one being. The office of an angel, whether it's an archangel or a stewardship angel or a helper angel, but particularly the ones that have specific purposes like archangels and stewardship angels, these are offices just like the mayor of the town is an office, or a senator from your state is an office, or the governor. These are offices that the people, that's their stewardship while they hold the office. While that angel holds that office, that's their stewardship. But that's not a forever stewardship. They're going to go on to greater things. They're also living a life of eternal progression. So they're going to go on to greater things. And at some point, another person, another being, is going to go into that office and become, in the case of Miriam, the new angel of the covenant. Now also remember, when you're talking about angels and whether they can live in a human, human life, in an actual lifetime, that any human no matter how wonderful they might be, or their life might be, they're still faced with the challenges of life, from work and making a living, to health, to relationships, as well as needing to deal with when jobs and health and relationships fall apart, as they do at some point in some way for everyone. And living in our physical lives is fairly all-consuming of our time and just taking care of our own life. And as we have time and means helping the lives of our close family and friends, there's not a lot of time to also be an angel. Angels are far beyond those type of grinding challenges in their eternal progression of life, and there will really be no point and no benefit to them or anyone else for them to live a full physical life like a normal person. While humans living a mundane human life are, are not going to be angels, they certainly can be used as physical tools of angels to achieve their purpose. So going back to the original question here, when this friend that, was, that saved a young girl from drowning, that friend was certainly uh, being guided by a guardian angel to be at that exact location at that exact moment so he could be the physical instrument to save her life. 
Next question, do angels have wings and feathers? And if not, why are they depicted like that in art? And the answer is angels can levitate and fly. That is most easily depicted in art with them having wings. And this was especially true in art before the 20th century, before humans could fly in machines and the only understanding or comprehension that anyone had of flying was if you had wings. So of course these levitating flying angels were depicted with wings because that's the only way people understood any, any person could be flying. Question, how do you know that you're communicating with angels and not demons? Demons are well known as excellent deceivers. And that is another great question, particularly as there certainly are many people who do or have done just that. They communicate with an invisible being that they assume to be an angel who in fact is just the opposite. Now, there are some ways that you can verify you're communicating with an angel and not a demon. Number one, angels will never give you advice that is not 100% always true and always helpful to you. A favorite trick of demons is to feed you many things that are true and actually helpful until you begin to trust them completely. Then they start to slyly slip in advice that is not helpful and is likely hurtful to you or others or both. And number two, Angels will never give you advice that encourages you to do anything less than honor your body as a temple of God and keep it in as healthy a state as possible. They will not advise you to eat foods that make you less healthy or use any type of mood or mind altering substances that are not medically necessary for a limited specific period to aid in recuperation from an illness or disease. Demons, on the other hand, will little by little lead you down paths that degrade your body and take away your self-esteem. They will do so just a little at a time so you don't even realize that you're going down into a darker place until you wake up one day and wonder, how did I ever become like this? And number three, unless your life is being physically threatened, angels will never encourage you to treat other people with anything less than love, calm, and a sincere willingness to listen and try to understand their perspective. Demons, on the other hand, are energetically fed by human conflict. And they will be relentless in stirring and instigating emotions and thoughts that cause you to have conflict with others, from your closest family to strangers. Next question is, do guardian angels or any angels obey us and serve us when we command it or command it with magical incantations or words? That's another good question, especially if you're involved in any kind of magic. And Celestine Light does involve magic. But the concept of us as mere humans being able to command vastly more powerful beings such as angels or genies such as some religions believe in, well, that's very appealing to the human psyche. But think about it. Why would a very powerful being such as an angel submit to the whims and commands of a tiny, almost powerless being like a physical human? However, magical incantations and words of power certainly do help to call in and receive benefit from the aid of angels. But calling in, also known as invoking, is not the same as commanding also known as evoking. Both are forms of summoning, but with a great difference in tone, attitude, and results when dealing with angels. Invoking, or calling in, is asking, such as, please come and help me. Whereas evoking is demanding, I order you to come and help me, and you must obey me. Now, it is possible to evoke certain angels with specific words. When you say those words of power, they will 100% of the time respond because that's their stewardship and the magical words of power are like Batman's bat signal calling a superhero. But evoking an angel merely brings their presence. They are still not going to follow any command that you attempt to give them. If you have a real need and it is for a purpose of light that will not be hurting or taking advantage of other people and it's within that particular angel's stewardship and calling, after you've evoked their presence, ask for their help and they will surely help you. Invoking will accomplish the same thing, but in a more respectful way that is more in harmony with dealing with angels and almost always leads to quicker results than a evoking. Now I have three books that will specifically help you to use magical and divine words and sigils, which are magical symbols, sigils, to vastly increase the help of angels in your life. The first is Words of Power and Transformation. This book contains magical words of power and their matching sigil to help you call in powerful, non-angelic forces to help manifest your desires. These are universal forces that are freely available to anyone who evokes and commands them. This book gives you over 100 words and their matching sigils so you can do it. Here's an example we use a lot 
to find lost items like car keys, cell phones, and important misplaced papers. And that's Ish Julante. Ish Julante, which is words of power number 92 in the book. Now, a very special feature of this book is that it gives you a link where you can listen to an audio pronunciation of each of the words of power. And that's very helpful in pronouncing the words correctly to ensure you're getting the maximum power and benefit. Like Ish Julante is not a word you're probably used to saying. Now, the next book is Angels of Miracles and Manifestation. And this is a book that everyone who truly wishes to communicate with angels and be generously blessed by their power should own. It contains the names and sigils of 144 stewardship angels and archangels. Now, here's a few examples from the book. This is Sally Sells, the angel of happiness. This is Wismar, the angel of good fortune. And this is Ziomileth, the angel of psychic and paranormal abilities. Next question is, what are the signs that you can know that your guardian angel is near or helping you? And are the signs like encountering feathers, tingling sensations, and ringing in your ears signs of the presence of angels? Hmm, I don't know, ringing in your ears? Well, that's common in medical condition that's usually called tinnitus. Feathers, tingling sensations, and other signs, to be truthful, are more likely common occurrences, but they're given uncommon significance once people have called upon their angels for help. But plus, I have to say that there's many books and videos about angels that tell people that these are signs of angels. So when they read the book or watch the videos and then call upon an angel and see a feather, for instance, they attribute it to making a successful connection to the angel, despite the fact that they may have passed dozens of feathers in the previous week and never noticed them because they were not looking for them. There are two surefire ways to know that you're being helped by angels. The first is that angels love to communicate telepathically. They talk to you in your head. You may hear the words audibly, like someone in the room speaking to you, or, or you may hear them silently in your mind as if you were thinking thoughts to yourself. Only these thoughts and words are coming from the angel that you're telepathically communicating with. Either way, you hear the words. You'll know you're not just mentally talking to yourself when you begin receiving answers that not only work, but they work to problems or challenges that you had not been able to solve on your own. And the results are the ultimate proof of the presence of angels. Call them, talk to them, ask them for help, and get answers that you hadn't been able to come up with on your own, and then get the results that you desired and sought. Next question is, what are the names of angels in the Bible, and aren't they the only true angels, with all others being just deceivers of evil? Well, there's actually very few angels mentioned in the Bible by name, or even by oblique reference. The only good angels mentioned by name, and then only a handful of times in the Old and New Testament, are Michael and Gabriel. The only other angels mentioned by name are evil angels, Lucifer, Satan, and Apollyon or Abaddon is the same, same angel by two different names. Next question is, can we see angels? I was alone in my house and I sensed a presence. When I turned to see if someone was there, I saw a giant glowing person. My ceiling is eight foot tall and he was hunched over so he was taller than eight feet. He didn't speak and he vanished shortly afterward. At first I was scared, but then I figured it must have been my guardian angel. The answer to that is that in rare instances, angels do show themselves physically in a form to humans, but it'll never be just an unspoken apparition like you described. If an angel appears in person to someone, it's very important. They will not depart without telling you in spoken words aloud why they have appeared to you. I knew a man many years ago that had a similar experience. He too was awakened from his sleep, but he awoke when he heard his name called out loud. Turning, he saw a glowing man, an angel, in a white robe standing beside his bed. He spoke aloud to him and told him that his pregnant wife was going to have a daughter, that they should name her Susan, and that she would be a prodigy and a blessing to the world. A few months later, this, his wife gave birth to their daughter, who they named Susan. And by the time she was 15, she was already a master on the piano. I had the privilege of listening to some of her music, and it was truly heavenly. Next question, do animals have guardian angels, or are animals themselves angels? The answer is animals are not angels, nor do they have guardian angels, but they have been blessed with far more intelligence than humans give them credit for, plus a great emotional capacity, a tremendous awareness of body language, and vastly more active sixth sense than most humans. And all those things together help keep animals safe. Next question. Can angels be married? 
And if they can, do they only marry other angels, or can they marry non-angels? Well, most angels at some point in their eternal progression live the life of a physical, mortal person, just like us. And because that's the path that all spirit children of Elohim must follow at some point in their existence. Once they have died and passed on to higher realms, if they're called to be an angel, they will be married. A married relationship gives them a greater understanding and empathy with the people that they're going to be working with, the humans they're going to be working with, and also has helped to mold their own character to help them to become worthy of being an angel. Now, most angels were married in an eternal marriage while they were still living a physical life. Their husband or wife from earth remains their husband and wife in higher realms. They would not be called to be angels unless they had this type of eternal love commitment and it was work working very well for them. And the last question is, how many charges does a guardian angel have? Well, the oracles of Celestine Light teach us that our earth is only one of countless earths. So many earths that they're as numberless as the grains of sand on a beach. In the Old Testament, Daniel 7.10, refers to angels and gives their number as 10,000 times 10,000. That's probably one of the very few references in any book of scripture that actually has a number. Well, 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. Now, I don't know how many of the 100 million are guardian angels. I know there's probably a lot more than 100 million. But even if all of them were guardian angels, that still would not be enough for every person on this earth of 7.5 billion people to have their own personal guardian angel. And that's not even counting the untold billions of other inhabited planets that are out there in our universe. Plus, most people actually have two guardian angels, a male and a female. So obviously, guardian angels have each have many, many people, thousands and thousands of people that they watch over and, they are, and that they're there to personally help when called upon. And that's why it's so important to know the name of your guardian angel and understand how to call upon them with the focused rhyming, saying their name three times, such as, as an example, Jolly, 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 please come to me, as I need, so let it be. Jolly, 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 please come to me, as I need, so let it be. And I won't say it the third time, but you get the idea. Now, in my book, Angels of Miracles and Manifestation, you'll see how you can discover the name of your guardian angels and begin communicating with them and receiving their blessings. But if you'd like me to discover the names of your guardian angels for you and give you more detailed instructions about how to connect with them, please go to the guardian angels link on my website www.ambrosen.com. Thank you very much for joining me on this special video answering your questions about guardian angels. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back next week with something very interesting to share with you. Namaste my brothers and sisters. Thank you.